number 449 to God be the glory number 449 
There is, um, they tried one medication already to stop the rejection, and it's really not working, but there is other medications you can do first to kind of stop that progression. Okay. Well, yeah, we definitely need to keep Dwayne in our prayers. Man, that, that's just, I know we prayed and prayed for him to get that kidney. And now, with things not looking good, we need to double up on those prayers for him. Because, you know, God can reach down and solve any problem. So let's, let's pray for Dwayne. And let's pray for Reese, too. Hope Reese is feeling better. Let's, let's keep Reese in our prayers as well. Do we have some other... Barbara? Dwayne, um, well, we had been praying for him to get that the new kidney, and he finally got it, but his body's rejected. So, and of course, he, she also said that the, the kidney he got came with a couple of infections that he had to fight over, too. So, we're praying for Dwayne there. Yeah. Marissa and Carter are sick with the virus, the oh. flu virus. Tom's getting better, but his head cold is getting better. So pray I don't get sick. <laughs> well, there we go. We've been praying for Tom to get better. We need to pray for Marissa and little baby Marissa. Carter. And, and pray for you. And how's, how's mom and dad doing? They're doing good as far as I... Oh, the, the, she did go to the doctor's today and he said, well, it's been two months. So uh, we need to get an x-ray so we can get that sling off you. And she's like, Oh, I'm still in so much pain. He's like, I know, but if it's healed, we need to start moving it. Because uh, what they said is she'll she'll have frozen shoulder, so yeah. that'll be a whole other thing. Oh yeah. Uh, because frozen shoulder, I've had it. It's it's a it's horrible fright to yeah. uh, freeze your shoulder. Well, you you've had it. So, now. You're the one to talk to her. Huh? Hopefully, hopefully it's it's healed, and if we could just get her to do exercises instead of going, that really mm -hmm. hurts. Well, let's keep Rosemary and Dave in our prayers. And you yeah, definitely I tell your dad we all miss I think she has 12 weeks of therapy, but oh. after that, he said she's going to have to do her own exercises. So, because it, it takes months. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Numbers. Well, let's keep them in our prayers, most definitely. We got the eye. Right. Okay. My neighbor fell. And he's got a brain bleed, Ooh. and he's been in the hospital over a week now, up in Portland. And his name? His name is Bob. Bob? Okay, yeah. Bob fell and he's got a brain bleed, and that just, yeah, that can not, usually not mean good things. <laughs> he may not come home, yeah. yeah. Hopefully they can drill in there and drain it out. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's keep him in our prayers. How's Howard doing? And as far as I know, he's, he's just rejecting the idea of getting surgery. Yeah. Yeah, yeah quality of life, you never know. It's got to be his choice. It is. Anything else that's not on our prayer list here that we should go over? If not, we'll go through the list here. Of course, Carrie's top of our list here. Everything good happening for Carrie. We're so glad that things are working out. And Glad her kids got back and came back, and seems to be some good things happening. We need to keep Carrie in our prayers that she can finish fighting off the rest of this cancer. Um, of course, we need to keep Matt in our prayers, and hopefully we'll be seeing him soon. How's your brother David doing? I think he's probably in treatment and stuff, but uh, I haven't been able to contact him. Oh, okay. Well, we got him on our prayer list, and we're going to keep him right there. He's, he, he's still having some heart problems and stuff, right? Well, remember, he was down for a long time. Yeah, yeah. They he, seem to have the COVID and then the, you know, the, you know, yeah. just been, they get one, one thing after another. It seems like they get the double whammy, you know. Yeah, sometimes it's rough. Well, yeah, let's keep praying for David. Uh, I see Franklin's not here. How's Franklin doing? He is good, good. He had to have a, uh, he went to the dentist yesterday, and I think he's having a little bit of repercussions. But he just didn't feel good. Okay. Well, he's not sick with any virus. You no, know, just a little weak. We'll pray for some strength for him. That's uh, that's always good to pray no matter what. And of course, continue to pray for Dick and Susie. Hope they'll be feeling well. Jerry, he's on our prayer list as well. Yeah, Jerry called me. He has. Oh, how's Jerry doing? He's sick and he's tired. 
Okay. He fired the funny so. Yeah. He's not sick. Okay. Well, that's good. Jerry's not sick, but he's feeling pretty tired tonight, so we're going to keep up the prayers for him, too. I'm glad things are working out as well as they can, but let's keep praying. Of course, we're going to got Jenny's doctor's appointments on here, so let's pray for Jenny. Steve's still traveling, and his sister's on our list here with a bone in her foot that's cracked. So I'm going to pray for Steve and his sister. Um... Again, Caitlin had asked for Mr. Meeks' cancer to be prayed for. We need to continue praying for Mr. Meeks. We'll probably move him down to our continual list. Uh, Lawrence, Jurgen had a stroke. He came back home to his home in Blue Bay. Okay. And, uh, Recovering now? Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, Jurgen's doing better. He's home here. He can still use some prayers for recovery. Yeah, he has to go to Portland. Yeah. And he's back home Tuesday. So he's back home Tuesday. Tuesday. Okay. <coughs> well, we can still keep up the prayers for him. Um, our granddaughter's other grandma lost their toe, her toe due to diabetes. Everything seems to be stable now. Yeah. Really good. She's healing up really well. Healing well. So she could probably take it off the list for now. Uh, Mikey, stepdaughter, cancer free. That's good, good. Yeah. And how are you feeling? Healing from that port? Oh, I'm, I'm here today. Oh, well, you always are. But <laughs> how are you feeling today? <laughs> uh, we keep up praying for you as well. And we'll pray for Jack. Hopefully Jack will be feeling better pretty soon. Barbara, how's your knee doing? Okay, okay. Well, we keep up praying for you as well. Well, that's good. That helps keep it under control. Good. Good. Glad to hear that. Um, Charmé, of course, Susie's sister needs our prayers. Jimmy's got cancer and Steve's traveling. Um, yeah, I have another note here. Can't quite read all my notes here. Well, I got Darby with cancer. Okay. Darby's, that's Darby. It wasn't Darby, but that's a what was Darby's? Oh, Adrian. No, that was Adrian. 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 I know, yeah, but it wasn't Darby. Yeah, it, it, Adrian is her daughter or something? Her daughter in law. Daughter in law. Yeah. And the other note I've got is Jim's knee infection, surgery, pray for recovery. I'm not Susie. I haven't. Oh, they're doing better. They're doing better. They were here Sunday. Uh, I guess they're not feeling well tonight. They were here Sunday morning. Sunday morning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're not sure who Jimmy with cancer was. Um, might have been somebody that was visiting that asked for prayers too. Not sure, but there we go. Um, of course, Lee Turner's memorial coming up. Anybody that wants to send cards, Derek's going. Good. Uh, in two weeks, I, uh, uh, Colin Burgess and John Gabriel's daughter are going to be here on. The 19th is Wednesday. Give us an update on what's going on in India and answer any questions that you have. Wow, okay. Uh, Wednesday, Wednesday the 19th. Wednesday, Wednesday the 19th. Wednesday the 19th of April. Mm -hmm. John Gabriel. John Gabriel's daughter. 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 And Tom Burgess. And Tom Burgess, okay. They'll be here. They'll be giving an update on everything going on with the India mission. That would be great to hear. Looking forward to hearing about that. Give us an update, and we're going to have to open it up to questions. Okay. <coughs> Sounds good. And, of course, we've got our rally coming up this summer. We're looking forward to that. We'll, of course, get more details on that as the summer comes along. Uh, 
Uh, anything else to add to our list? Let's continue to pray for all our missionaries. Yeah, Lord. Um, pray for me, please. Uh, I have no energy level. Okay. Okay, so we need to be praying for Lawrence. Uh, his physically seems to be drained and tired and not getting around. May just need to get out and start walking a little. But let's pray for Lawrence. Pray that he starts feeling a little better. We got any other prayer requests before we go into our prayer time? If not, Tom, can you start us out tonight? And I'll finish when we're done. Our Father in heaven, heaven, we're thankful that you can be here this evening, Lord, for this time of fellowship and hear messages from your word, Father God. At this time, we'd like to continue to pray for Carrie and, and, and her cancer, Lord, and pray that you will heal her completely and be with, be with those all on our cancer list and be with them and give them strength and, and determination to carry on and pray for our little old son, Robert, uh, that you will be able to heal his uh, all addiction and and uh, we're thankful that uh, you hear our prayers and you give him those back to us, Father God. And we pray, pray for continued healing there. And, uh, and everybody else that has on our list, Lord, we uh, lift them up to you and, and sit there and pray that, Father God, that uh, your will be done in each case. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Good evening, and we thank you, Lord, for all the blessings we bring to you this time, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with him. Pray, Lord, that you'll fight all those bad infections for him, Lord, and turn his healing away from not wanting to heal from his implant. We pray, Lord, that you'll give him strength, guide him, and protect him, Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name.
Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for all the blessings that you pour out upon our lives every day. We thank you for the answered prayers. We thank you for all the help you give us even when we don't ask. Dear Lord, you know when we need it, and we thank you. You reach down into our lives so many times. It seems like with every answered prayer, we've got 20 more prayers to give to you. We've got a lot of people on our prayer list that need your help. Jackie needs to be feeling better. Need to be with Jerry, Jenny. Be with Lawrence, help give him strength. Help encourage him. Be with Steve as he's traveling. Help bring him safely home to us. Be with Matthew, help bring him back to us. Be with all those that are lost and searching. Help our light to shine out. Be a beacon to bring them in and share your love with them. Make them live their life better. I just pray that we can reach out to this community. I pray for you to reach out to the world. Help us to reach out to the world. Be with all the missionaries working around this world, working for your cause, dear Lord. Many of them just need strength, need guidance, need a little protection, dear Lord. And they need your hand. And I know, and we all know, that we rest in your hands. We can always count on you to guide and protect us. Pray that you'll be with Derek tonight as he brings a message from your word. Help open our hearts and minds to hear the message that you have prepared for us. Pray that you'll just guide us in our lives and keep us safe. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Okay, we're going to be small in number, right? but that's okay. We are in uh, First Timothy, chapter, I mean, Second Timothy, chapter three. Second <clears throat> Timothy, chapter three. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Paul and his mission-minded vision and attitude and that um, we accomplished so much for your kingdom and were able to learn from all of his experiences, his head knowledge and wisdom, and all the, the words that your spirit put on his heart pray that you would help us to learn from it tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Timothy 3, Timothy 3 and starting in verse 1. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, 
not lovers of the good. Treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Have nothing to do with such people. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over weak-willed women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires. Always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these teachers oppose the truth. They are men of depraved minds, who as far as the faith is concerned are rejected. But they will not get very far because, as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, and endurance persecutions and sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions that I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So verse 1, uh, he says, mark my words, I mean not mark my words, <laughs> mark this, there will be <laughs> terrible times in the last days. Um, now when we read this, we usually think he's talking about, you know, the very end of time before the Lord returns. Um, <laughs> And uh, as Paul begins, you know, he does use this future tense, you know, people will be like this and this, right? But then as you go down the paragraph and you get to verse 5, he's telling Timothy, avoid these people. So they must already be around, right? <laughs> um, and uh, then especially when you get to verse 6 and following, it's very clear that uh, this is something that's, that's already going on and is, is part of uh, what's happening uh, in the church and whatnot. Now, the, new, in the, the term, the last days, um, it began uh, with basically Jesus coming, his death and resurrection and the ascension. And uh, and the beginning of the of the church in Acts. When Peter gets up on um, the day of Pentecost and he preaches that sermon in Acts chapter two, he states that we are in the last days. He he quotes from the um, the prophet Joel, who said, "In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all people." And there's a couple of other references too, but according to the scripture, the last days, uh, you know, uh, basically begins with Jesus and the day of Pentecost onward. So they were in the last days 2,000 years ago, and we're still in the last days. Um, we will be until Jesus comes back. But it also says here in our text in verse 13 that evil men will grow worse and worse. So the last days is it's going to intensify as we get near to the second coming. In fact, Jesus said it'll be like the days of Noah, uh, which in that text says that men were thinking evil things all the time. So um it's everything's going to grow in intensity and in verse one he says in the last days there will be terrible times um now if your translation says difficult that's kind of a poor uh word for this even terrible doesn't really say it all uh this word that 
is either translated difficult or terrible. Um, it's only used one other time in the New Testament, and it's used to describe the gathering demoniac. Remember that guy who was uh, running around in the, the caves naked, and they tried to chain him down, and even the chains broke, and he was crazy? That's the word describing that guy. <laughs> so, um, so um, basically, wild, crazy, violent is a better way to describe what Paul is saying here. Um, that there's going to be these wild, crazy, and violent times coming. Are we in that? <laughs> I don't think we are. <laughs> Let's turn on the news, right? Um, also, the word for times can mean seasons. And I think that's probably what Paul's referring to here. In the last days, there will be terrible seasons, wild, crazy, violent seasons. In the last three years, from 2020 till now, uh, it's been a very wild, crazy, and violent season, hasn't it? Um... And I think we've all kind of had our fill, but who knows what's next, right? But uh, it's been a terrible time in our history, and uh, because of the moral and spiritual confusion that's going on, and Paul says that that's going to characterize the last days. So everything he's listed in here perfectly fits the time we're in now, anyway. So in verses 2 to 5, Paul gives 19 characteristics that describe... Uh, Different types of people, how people are going to react in the last days. Like I said, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. Um, and then uh, down in verse 4, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. So one of the biggest problems uh, that Paul describes in this paragraph is that they kind of have this misdirected love, right? They love themselves, they love pleasure, they love money, they don't love God. They don't love what's good. So, it's kind of this misdirected love that's happening in, in the world. And it basically begins when you put yourself on the throne and take God off the throne. It's, this, it's selfish, it's self-promoting kind of, kind of love that's happening. And... Um, and that's kind of the foundation for all of these sins that, that Paul lists here in this passage. Because when we, you know, when we don't allow God to have his rightful place, then everything else is out of whack, right? Because we're to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. And uh, that's the number one most important commandment. And if that's altered in any way, you know, then we kind of start sliding down this downward spiral, right? So our culture, not just our culture, but other countries as well, you know, was pushing God off his rightful place. And all these other sins begin to happen. People are boastful, proud, abusive towards others. Kids become disobedient to their parents. I mean, I know just in my generation, I've seen that go way down compared to how it used to be. Um, people becoming ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, no self-control, brutal. They don't love things that are good. They love evil things instead. They're treacherous, they're rash, they do things without thinking about the consequences, they're conceited. So all those characteristics, it's just kind of uh, the erosion of morality. Yeah? Hey Derek, I heard for the first time yesterday on the TV, uh, Tommy Hayden, and it's, I think I've been thinking this, and so of course because of myself, mainly. Uh -huh. That uh, saying something like you're talking about, with the strife that the country is in today, that he's heard, uh, evidently, that his uh, 
people, the people that listen to your show on the radio often, have been talking more about religion because of the strife and the peace that the way they're in mm -hmm. are coming back to the church. Yeah, the well, yeah, I, there, there is some revivals I heard that are starting to happen mm -hmm. uh, throughout the country. Um, I mean, I wasn't a part of them, so I don't know how legit it was or anything, but but I have been hearing things that are that are happening, you know. Uh, so sometimes, yeah, when things get more evil, progresses more evil, sometimes we have people wanting to come back to the Lord, or part, mm -hmm. you know, part of the culture, you know, realizes how depraved things are getting, and they want to get back to God. You know? I remember, you know, uh, when 9-11 happened, uh, right after that, the churches were packed again. Um, it didn't last forever, but for a while it was like everyone thought it was the end of the world, you know, and uh, everybody started coming back to church. So, yeah, those things can start happening sometimes when there's when there's more evil in the world happening, for sure. Um, but at the same time, you kind of have these polar, it gets, things get more evil, and then some, the, the people that are godly, you know, they straighten up, and so you kind of have these polar the good get better, the, the evil get worse. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that kind of thing going on. Uh, verse 5 he says, having a, a form of godliness, but denying its power. So it's it's hollow, it's external, you know, it's something that doesn't really hold up. It claims to be godly, but it doesn't have the power to cha change individual lives, you know. Underneath this facade, it's just kind of all empty. And there's a lot of churches that are kind of doing this thing. They just kind of preach this, uh, here's how to have a better life. But they don't really get into the Bible. They don't talk about sin. You know, they don't deal with, you know, the heart of what the gospel is all about. Verse 6, he says, they are the, the kind who worm their way into homes and they gain control over weak-willed women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires. So these, these false teachers, they're manipulators, they're seducers, they're, they're using people for their own purposes, they're worming their way into homes and uh, deceiving these unsuspected women who are weak, and part of it's because Paul said their lives are, are full of sin. And uh, I'm going to touch more on that in a minute. But in verse uh, 7, he says, Always learning, but never able to acknowledge the truth, just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these men oppose the truth. Men of depraved minds, who as far as the truth is concerned, are rejected, but they will not get away. Uh, they will not get far because in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. Now, when when uh, when God called Moses uh, through the burning bush, remember He sent Moses to Pharaoh to say, "Let my people go." Uh, and then God brought about the, the plagues as a warning to Pharaoh, you know, that it's foolish to resist the, the hand of the Almighty. Now, what's interesting about that text, though, is that Pharaoh's magicians were able to imitate the first couple of the plagues. Um, so, um, but ultimately, they were no match for God. Well, the names of those magicians who were using this sorcery and trying to match the power of God, their names were Janus and Jambres. These were the two guys, you know, that um, were able to, to imitate Moses, you know, when he first laid down a staff and then became a snake. And then they laid there down and they became snakes too. But remember, Moses' snake ate up their snakes. <laughs> and uh, um, I always think about the, you know, the cartoon the what is it um, um the Disney one the Egypt uh, uh, Prince of Egypt Aladdin. Oh, Prince no. of Egypt Prince
Prince of Egypt. That's it. Yeah, remember those two guys that were doing the trying to do the the, the miracles and stuff. I, that's why I always think about that. Um, but they were able, so they were able to turn the sticks into uh, snakes, and then they were able to um, change water into blood. I mean, that's not an easy thing to do. And then they were able to make frogs come up from the from the Nile. I never understood why they wanted to. I mean, they're getting a plague, and they're trying. They're enhancing the plague. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> right? I think if they really had any power, they would undo it. But anyway. But then when we get to the third plague, the plague of the gnats, which it says that God took dust and he made the dust into gnats, that they weren't able to do that uh, miracle, to imitate it. And they came before Pharaoh, and this is what they said. They said, this is the finger of God. So from that point out, you know, uh, they were out of the game. They couldn't, they, they couldn't yeah, yeah. compete with what God was doing. Um, but there was some sorcery going on here. I mean, this, this is black magic, you know, for them to be able to even do those first three, you know. But what Paul is saying is, you know, they opposed the truth. They opposed God's messenger. And, but Paul's saying they're false teachers, and eventually it'll show. You know, maybe at first... You might be able to deceive a couple people. Oh, you know, they have just as much power as God or something. And then as time goes on, you realize, you know, they're not the real deal. You know, they're, they're the frauds. You know, they're the, they're the charlatans and stuff, you know. So uh, that's what he's saying. You know, watch out for these, for these false doctrines and everything. They, they claim that God's on their side. Uh, but it couldn't be further from the truth. And he, and then Paul talked about how they prey on the vulnerable. So he says they worm their way into households. They take captive these weak women. And I think what Paul's point there is that, you know, the women in that day, and we've talked about it before, they were kind of marginalized in those days. You know, they didn't, they weren't allowed to have very much education, or most of them weren't anyway. They weren't allowed to have a role in public things. Um, and uh, even in public, they weren't allowed to just speak to their husbands and stuff like that, at least in the Jewish culture. Um, but uh, so these men would kind of pay attention to these women, flatter them, seduce them, uh, deceive them. And so these, these weak women, who Paul says are burdened down with guilt because of the, the sins, their evil desires. So these false teachers are coming in and they're manipulating them and deceiving them. So Paul is saying to Timothy, uh, there's, there's going to be these charlatans, these swindlers, you know, who are going to prey on the weak. And uh, Paul encourages Timothy with these words. He says in verse 9, uh, but they will not get very far because, as in the case of those men, and he's going back to Janus and Jambres, those, those guys that Moses dealt with, their folly will be clear uh, to all. So the, the troll is, they don't last long, but, but the problem with it, even though they don't last long, it seems like there's always somebody else to take their place, right? <laughs> there's always somebody else coming up. With something. So if you're going to stand true during these hard times, how are you going to do that? Well, so Paul answers that question in verses 10 to 16. And he answers that question in two parts. First of all, he talks about having examples that are worth following. And then in the second part, he talks about having a, a resource that's worthy of your trust. So, um, so in verses 10 to 13, he talks about uh, examples to follow, people to follow, examples. And then in verses 14 to 16, he talks about the value of Scripture. And we're going to talk about that next time because it's going to take uh, the whole lesson to talk about it. But it's, he talks about the Word of God and how powerful it is for everything that we need in life. Um, but in verses 10 to 13, I want to I want to deal with that tonight and um, Paul is saying 
um, you know, that it might sound kind of like Paul's bragging a little bit here, but he's just, he's trying to give Paul, um, he knows Timothy, you know, they, they were, they were friends for 15 years, traveled around, you know, um, on all these missionary journeys, and so, you know, he, he can be real with Timothy, and he's just, he's just saying, you know, you're, you're now taking my place, you're taking the baton, you're carrying on here, and follow my example, you know, you were with me for all these years, and now you're supposed to continue this, this ministry, and just remember all the things that I did, you know, remember how I dealt with different situations, so he's, he's trying to recall all of these things, this pattern to follow, just basically walking in the footsteps of, of Paul. The writer of Hebrews says, remember those leaders who taught you the word of God, and considering the outcome of their lives, imitate their faith. Um, also, in 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So this isn't the only time that Paul talks about imitating, or Hebrews talks about imitating our forefathers. He's just saying, you know, I know the correct path, I followed it, and then later to say, I fought the good fight, you know, so follow, just follow what I did. Um, remember, he says, first of all, remember my teaching. So Timothy got to sit in the audience of, of Paul preaching for 15 years, all these places that they went. So uh, I'm sure that he knew pretty much everything that Paul had to say. I'm sure a lot of the talks were repeated and basically got this, those ideas down, you know, after 15 years. And then he says, and you know my way of life, you know, you know the way that I conducted myself. He's talking about his behavior, but also the values that, that he held to, because, you know, Paul got to see Timothy not only preach the sermons, but then how he lived after the sermon was over, because they were just doing everything together 24-7. So he got to see the words he preached, but also the lifestyle that he lived, and he says, you know my purpose, my aim in life, you know, the, my, my goals. He says, imitate my pattern of life. And then he, he says, imitate my character. And he, he, he names four aspects of his character that Tim, Timothy needs to follow. His faith, his patience, his love, his endurance. These were the four things that Paul thought were the most important seen these four characteristic traits in my life remember how I was faithful how I had patience how I loved people how I endured through all these trials and then in the the last section here he puts a lot of emphasis on persecution I mean Paul's life was just filled with all kinds of, of persecution he had to endure a lot for the sake of Christ for the for the sake of the gospel so he says, persecutions and sufferings, uh, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions that I endured. Now those persecutions there that he lists in these three cities, that was like at the very beginning. That was like at 15 years ago on his first missionary trip. So why did Paul bring up those? Because there was a lot of persecutions after that. You know, that it's just... But I think why he's bringing that up, because that's the time where Paul first uh, met Timothy and interacted with him, and, um, and he experienced a lot of uh, difficult persecutions that time um, in Lystra, that's where he got stoned to death, and so, you know, Timothy was able to uh, witness that, just Paul's being stoned and then God raising him back up. He just put him back on his feet and him, you know, enabled him to keep preaching. And so he's, he's saying to Timothy, you know, you've seen me from the very beginning. You've witnessed all these various persecutions that I've been through, all the suffering that I've been through. You see me in every, any and every situation. Um, so he didn't have any illusions to what the, the gospel ministry was all about, you know. And, um, so, 
It's through those sufferings, it's through those persecutions, and Paul talked about it many times in his preaching, that that's what shapes us, that's what makes us. That's what um, enables us to have these powerful moments in our life, these, these moments where we're changed. And uh, so Timothy witnessed all of that. And he endured through all of that. He says, um, yet the Lord rescued me from them all. Now, you, you might kind of think, huh? Because right now he's sitting in prison. So how is God rescued her from all of them? I think what he's saying there is that, uh, you know, he could have died many times, you know, throughout these 15 years of ministry. Um, but God just kept delivering him from all those situations. He delivered him from prison after prison after prison. You know, eventually he got out. He was in there usually two or three years, but... God always made sure he got it out, and then he was able to do more mission work, and then he got in another prison. And then, but even when he was in those times of prison, they were crucial moments in his life too, because that's when he wrote all these letters. They wouldn't have them if he never went to prison. So, all through all those things, you know, God just made sure his his life kept going. And he talks about four different uh, shipwrecks that he was in, survived all of them. All these beatings he talks about. God just kept him going through all of it, you know. Continued his mission. And so, the thing about that I love about seeing all of that, all that Paul experienced, especially when he got stoned to death and then God just raised him back up, is that we're not going home until God calls us home. When it's our time to die, we'll die and we'll go home. And nothing else is going to prevent us from that moment. We're going to live until that time, and Paul's life is a perfect example of that because he just, all these different types of near-death experiences, you know, and he just, God wasn't done with him yet, so okay, get up, let's go, and he made sure that he kept extending his life, so God's in control of our lives, there's nothing we can do about it anyway, and so we're just going to go until he calls us, and uh, so that's, I think, his point, just keep persevering, don't give up. You know, God, God knows the number of the days. And then he tells Timothy, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And this is a theme throughout the scriptures. Jesus talked about it. All the writers of the gospel talk about it. Um, you have to pick up your cross and follow Jesus. That's the Christian life. And so if you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to be persecuted. And so Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. So he's saying, Timothy, expect it, you know. It's going to be a part of your journey. Don't think that God's picking on you <laughs> or something like that, you know. Um, Jesus didn't promise we're going to escape from trials and suffering, you know. Uh, but he does promise that his presence will be with us every step of the way. And that it won't last forever. There is a heaven in the foreground, you know, coming our way. And then in verse 13, uh, Paul warns Timothy to get ready because things are going to go from bad to worse. Evil men are going to get more evil. So get ready for and we, like Timothy, we need to get ready for that. You know, I, I watch the news and I just think, oh, when is this going to be over? And then it just gets worse, it seems. But, you know, then I read my Bible and I'm like, you know, I just I need to change my perspective. Because it's not going to get better, it's going to get worse. And there can be revivals, like Mike was talking about. You know, there can be some good things that are happening. But overall, the evil of men is going to you know, continue to slide downhill until Jesus comes back. Um, but so we just need to, to keep that perspective that you know our citizenship is in another place and um, we're not living for the now, we're living for the not yet. So our choice, you know, must be to just to ask for strength for the Lord Jesus to help us through the hard times and um, ask for his grace that his spirit um, can help us 
and um, that we can be our best, you know, to, to not give up or to, to stay on the sidelines, but we need to get in there and, you know, do what we can while we have the opportunity. And, um, and just know, too, that people are watching this, because just like Paul, at the end of his life, he could look back and he didn't have to say, oh, you know, don't do what I did, just do what I preached, you know. He can say, look at my life, you know. I preached it, but I also lived it. And to be able to have a life where you can tell people that, you know, and I think that's what God wants to do, because you never know, people are always watching you, you never know who's watching you, people are watching you, and so we need to set a good example for them. Anybody have anything? What's that? I just said you said example. It's like yeah. a prayer blessing. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay, well, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your scripture is so important. It encourages us, it helps us to understand the truth, to have the right perspective. And we thank you for Paul and all that he went through. And uh, we pray that we can just imitate his life and follow his example of what it means to be a missionary, what it means to persevere, keep our eyes on Jesus. Help us to also just keep our to follow Jesus, and he's a perfect example to follow. Better than Paul, and he did everything exactly right. So just help us to look at these examples and follow in their footsteps and keep our faith and just keep enduring and know that you've got a plan for everything, that you're sovereignly in control, even though it seems like you always see control of the world at times, that we know ultimately that you're in charge, and so we can just hold that close to our hearts and, and realize the truth of that, and that um, just keep doing what we know that you want us to do, that we can please you and live our lives to glorify your name and to bring others to Christ. Help us to do that this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.